change. The issue that hovers around the psychedelic experience, it was mentioned last night, it's strong in my life. I haven't found any uh, real solution other than hold your nose and jump. But the issue is surrender. This is something real. You don't find people going into the ashram in the morning to meditate with their knees knocking in fear because of how terrifying and profound they know that meditation is going to be. But if they were going in there to smoke DMT, you know, they would be fully riveted on the modalities of what was about to happen. I mean, we can tell shit from Shinola. It's just that we don't always prefer Shinola. Uh, and, and I'm not like, ad, I don't advocate it, you know, people, like sometimes there are people who are disappointed because they say, well, how often do you do it? Well, the answer is not very often. I mean, if I can get it in a couple or three times a year, I feel like I'm hitting it pretty hard. And the more successful it is, the less often you have to do it. I mean, I know people who say DMT is their most favorite drug. And when you say, well, when was the last time you did it? They say, well, 1967. There's, it only lasted four minutes. They're still processing it. And, and they are still processing it. They're not just whistling Dixie. I mean, I, it is, to my mind, the, just the most... Well, I mentioned this earlier, the question, how do they keep the lid on this stuff? And I suppose here I'm preaching to the converted because every, many people last night said they had an interest in this kind of thing. But um, they don't keep the lid on sexuality. No society has ever had it so under control that people didn't have sex. I mean, they may have had sex under weird conditions and uh, uh, under, you know, ritual strictures and this and that. But we are like this salamander that has the option of never developing into its mature form. And to my mind, that's a tragedy because this is our birthright and somehow our inability to get a grip on our global problems has to do with this immaturity about our mental state. The two, I, I feel very strongly, are linked. And that, of course, we can't get control of the world because we are children in some profound way. And we don't like being children. It's, it, but the culture has reinforced a form of infantilism. And the, the way I explain it to myself is... It's a kind of unwillingness to go it alone on a certain level. I don't know how many of you remember in Brave New World, Huxley's brilliant dystopia, but there's a scene in there where um, Bernard, who is the guy who's out of it in the novel because in his fetal fluid they got an alcohol contaminant, and so he's different from everybody else in this society. And he occasionally has original thoughts. And he and his uh, assigned girlfriend for the evening or whatever she is are in a helicopter. And they sweep out past the crematoria that, where they're recollecting elements for reuse. And he suspends the helicopter over the Black Bay uh, and... Uh, and she immediately becomes very agitated, restless, anxious, and pleads with him to return to the city. And what it is, is it's her anxiety over being alone in the presence of nature. She literally can't take it. And I think there are a lot of people in our society, uh, and each of us in our own way at different times, who uh, have within us this neurotic and infantile creature that can't face it alone and that this um, going it alone thing is very important. You know, Plotinus, the great Neoplatonic philosopher, he spoke of the mystical experience as the flight of the alone to the alone. And... Um, in the psychedelic experience, there is this issue of surrender. 
because a lot of people want to diddle with it. They want to be able to say they did it, but they don't ever want to face an actual moment where they put it all on the line. And yet the whole issue with this stuff is to let it lead, to let it show what it wants to show. So somehow, individually, we have to reclaim our experience. Uh, the, the real message, more important even than the psychedelic experience, the real message that I try to leave with people in these weekends is the primacy of direct experience. That as people, the real universe is, uh, you know, within your reach, always. Everything not within your reach is basically unconfirmed rumor. And we insert ourselves like ants or honeybees into hierarchies of knowledge. So we say, well, what's going on in the world? Well, turn on CNN. You know, and then somehow we're ordered. Then we say, aha, uh -huh, okay, it's 85 degrees in Baghdad and the wind is out of the northeast at 15 miles an hour. And we feel somehow better now because we're getting the information. But what we have done is sold out direct experience. And all institutions require this of us that we somehow redefine ourselves for the convenience of the institution. And this redefinition always involves a narrowing, a denial, so that, you know, if you want to be in Marxist society, if you want to function in Marxist society, you have to define yourself as a Marxist human being. Well, it turns out in a Marxist society there are no homosexuals because that just happens in decadent societies. So then, you know, if you happen to notice any tendency like this in yourself, you have to deny its existence because it just does, this just doesn't happen in a Marxist society. And similarly, every society has this. In our society, if you hear voices, we have mental hospitals for you. Uh, if you if you have vast visions of the future, uh, you know we have drugs that can help you and uh, make this go away. Uh, so we so then somehow in modern society the discovery of psychedelics is the discovery that all of this cultural machinery is just Wizard of Oz stuff. You remember the scene in The Wizard of Oz where the curtain is swept back and they see the little guy there and he says, booming out over the loudspeaker, ignore the little man pulling the levers. <laughs> ignore the little man pulling the levers. Well, the little man pulling the levers is what sweeps into view with psychedelics and you discover, aha, culture is provisional, you know, whether we have nine wives or three, whether we tattoo ourselves blue, whether we eat insects or not, all of these things are just decisions that we make. And then we congratulate ourselves on our wisdom and we live within that and we hunt down and kill all the people who disagree with us. And that's called having a culture, having a way of life, uh, being somebody. But with you know, I don't see history as a wrong turning. I see it, the metaphor that I like is that of the prodigal son, that there was a reason for this long descent into matter, this peregrination. It was a shamanic journey of some sort. You know, the shaman goes into the, the world pool or ascends the world tree to go to the center of the axis of the cosmos to recover the pearl, the pearl or the gift or the lost soul, and then return with it. And this is what history was, I think. It was a descent into the hell worlds of matter, energy, space, and time for the purpose of recovering something that was lost, it wasn't lost by us. It was lost by the 
breathing the diastole of the planet just climax of climate moved us into paradise and then moved us out of paradise i mean you must that the story of eden is the story of history's first drug bust i mean it's the story of a whole lot of tension over who's going to take or not take a certain plant which confers knowledge and yawa wandering in the garden says to himself if the man and the woman eat of the fruit they will become as we are the issue was co-equality co-knowledge with the creator well where where do we stand you know in man's existential march uh, uh, how does that work can we always accept the subservient infantile position i mean is knowledge to be dispensed by uh gods and if not gods then the institutions that appoint themselves as gods over us or is it actually that uh maturity begins with somehow claiming this birthright and it is a birthright and i don't know if a, if if a society can survive the claiming of this birthright by a large number of people certainly in the 1960s when this was attempted everything everybody got very agitated and then uh, it was frozen out in in so-called primitive or pre-literate societies there is the office of the shaman and the the shaman is deputized to act for all of us in the same way that we have airplane mechanics to fix jet engines we have shamans to explore these hidden and fairly terrifying other dimensions the people who self select themselves into a group like this in a society like that would be the candidates for this kind of shamanic voyaging um 